Public Affairs programming on WQPT is brought to you by The Singh Group at Merrill Lynch. Serving the wealth management needs of clients in the region for over 25 years. Iowa's Democratic ticket includes a local lawmaker and bringing the inner author out of view. The great opportunities for writers in the cities. The race for governor in Iowa became much clearer this week as the Democratic candidate challenging incumbent Republican Governor Kim Reynolds announced his running mate. State Democrats approved Fred Hubble's selection of Clinton County State Senator Rita Hart, a teacher and farmer who has served in the Senate for six years. Her district includes both Clinton and Scott counties. They both sat down with me on the first day of their Iowa Forward campaign tour, where we started with a simple question. Why are you running? You know, I'm running because, look, we need to turn our state around and we need to give it back to Iowans. Right now, the part, the outside special interests and the Republican Party are controlling our state. I don't think the governor really cares about all Iowans, and I want to represent Iowans. We need a governor who cares about all Iowans, whether it's farmers or teachers or, or working families, doesn't matter. You know, we need to get a, a governor there who knows how to balance the budget and put that balance behind the right priorities with the right values. That's education and health care and infrastructure all across our state. And when the governor said at the end of the last legislative session in 2017, she thought it was the best ever. She said it many times, I thought it was the worst ever. So I decided, look, I've got to step up and go to work and protect our state and turn it back in the right direction. Is it important to have a non-politician running for governor these days? I don't think it's important, but, but I think if you look what's been going on in our state, uh, it's time to have somebody different running our state. You've also picked a running mate with the Quad City Roots, uh, Senator yes. Hart here. Why, why'd, you, why'd you select Senator Hart? Because if I'm governor and something happens to me, she'd be a great governor. Uh, she shares the same values I do about putting people first and investing in our future in the state. Uh, and she's got the, the skills to be able to travel around the state and represent our campaign just as well as I do so we can divide up and, and cover the state many, much more effectively with two of us. And she brings the, the same values but a different background. And in my experiences, I've found out that you get people with different backgrounds, different experiences, you make better decisions because you hear more about the, how other people are thinking, what other people want. And uh, she has different background than I do, which is great. I think that's what we need. Why did you decide to join the team? I think just like uh, Fred talked about, we had a really tough last two years in the, in the, in the legislative session. I'm really concerned about what um, is happening because of our inability to fund education adequately. Um, I've been dealing nearly every day with people who are negatively affected by our, our Medicaid privatization decision. Um, I, I just think that there are a lot of problems that have been resulting because we have had to take these mid-year budget cuts and we've had some tragic results as a, as a, as a result of that. And so it's uh, time for new leadership and I'm excited that Fred has chosen me to be part of that team and, and I'm looking forward to uh, taking that shared vision and uh, making some great things happen. Well, I obviously want to start with the issues and one of them of course would be the economy. And let's take a look at unemployment right now at 2.7%. As you know, people vote their pocketbook um, and more people are employed in Iowa right now than in years ago. So how do you campaign against something like that? Other well, than saying we could do better. Well, uh, let's look at what's going on with people's personal income. It's nice to have a job, but if your personal income is, is low, then that job's not necessarily paying a livable wage. For the last four years in a row, Iowa has had either 46th, 48th, to 49th in the country in personal income growth. And we already started with having one of the lowest average incomes in the country to begin with. So we do have record low unemployment, you're exactly right, but we also have record low uh, personal income growth for people in our state. So people are really struggling. Uh, you know, it's good to have a job, but people want jobs to pay livable wages. And that's not what this governor and this legislature have been attracting. Have we been seeing enough for job training, or do you want to see more of that as far as Iowans are concerned? Well, absolutely. We know that um, what the solution is, is that we need better, better skilled education, skilled worker education. And um, so th as a response, now we've been cutting back on our, our uh, funding for education, and that's a mismatch. 
And so that's really true in, in the district that I have represented over the last six years, you know. Um, Clinton County is a county that's a mix of manufacturing base and a rural economy. And um, we're seeing that um, both of those are being pushed and pressured and uh, the, the income levels have, have been struggling. And so we need to do better. You, of course, made your name as chairman of Yonkers, and then you see Yonkers going into bankruptcy. You see these stores. I mean, a true iconic Iowa store. That must pain you in a lot of ways. When you, when you see retail changing to this extent and stores like Yonkers closing statewide and throughout the Midwest. Well, I went into the Yonkers business in 1985 when it was a break-even business, and it needed a lot of help. Uh, and we recruited a lot of new senior managers in there. Uh, we expanded, on, expanded the employment in our stores. Uh, we gave a lot of power and autonomy to the people who worked in the stores because they knew their customers. We invested in the people who knew the customers. And that's why the store ended up doing very well. So the, despite the farm crisis, the, the store expanded, do, did well. We actually bought the Brandeis business in, over in Nebraska, merged that together. Uh, and then we sold 100% of it to the public because it was doing so well in 1992. So I didn't have any involvement with Yonkers since 1992, but it disappoints me greatly to see a store or a business. A lot of people that I worked with were doing well, uh, and all of a sudden, over another 20, 25 years, it just got managed poorly, took on a lot of debt, uh, at a time when companies like that with low margins can't afford a lot of debt. And, and uh, now this business is gonna close. It's, really, it's, it's a sad story for our, for those people who work there as well as for the customers in our communities. I wanted to ask you also about some of your introductory ads. What, what most people know of you is from your advertisements and you were very strong in your support for Planned Parenthood. You listed as one of the uh, organizations that you do support and you're actively involved. Why is that important to you and, and, and the role of Planned Parenthood now in Iowa of course is greatly reduced in the Quad Cities. It's actually pulled out of this area. I, I have for a very, you know, when I was at Yonkers, just to give an example, I had 5,000 employees and, and, uh, and across six states. You know, we had tens of thousands of customers. Healthcare is very important. A lot of our employees, a lot of our customers were females, you know, so healthcare for women was very important. So uh, when I was asked to go on the board of Planned Parenthood uh, at a time when, uh, that was when Ronald Reagan was president, this was the 1980s, and it was a tough time for them. But they provide good quality, confidential healthcare for men and women, then and now. Uh, they provide cancer screenings, they provide sexual transmitted diseases testing for people. Uh, they do a lot of things that people don't know about that are very important, and they do it on a sliding scale. So if people can't afford it, and they don't want to go to the emergency room, they can go to Planned Parenthood to get confidential, uh, you know, uh, inexpensive medical service, which is what they need. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge supporter of expanding access to health care in general. That's why we have such a, a problem in Iowa with the privatization of Medicaid. We never should have privatized it. And then when, since we privatized it, it's been a failure. If the governor was a real leader, she would have said, look, we made a mistake, we're gonna change it, we're gonna bring it back in and manage it the way we were before. Uh, there are a lot of other states that have done that, made that choice. Uh, and we can, we're gonna do the same thing if we get elected. You know, because we want to expand access to health care. People can't go to work if they're not feeling healthy. People can't work in their communities. They can't volunteer in their communities. They can't be an effective teacher. They can't do well in school if they don't have decent health care. It affects every part of our society. Well, and you also point out the education point. I'm sure you were talking about K through 12, but also uh, a secondary education in the three universities. Are you worried about Northern Iowa and Iowa State and the fact that perhaps we're gonna lose more Iowa students because of a changing tuition rates? Absolutely, and I'm also worried about higher college debt. If we're going to move this state forward, our young people have to be assured that they can get a quality education at a reasonable price. And we need people to be in fields that are gonna keep this state moving forward. And if they cannot um, affordably do that, then we're all in trouble. And so it's a big concern that uh, we adequately fund all education at every level because that's how we, that's how we train the people that are going to take those jobs that are going to get that better, higher income and forge a better future. Well, as you've seen over the years, Iowa's becoming more and more red rather than purple. We have more Republicans obviously running both houses of the legislature, the governors. Uh, imagine the two U.S. senators are all Republicans. How are you a new Democrat? How, how are you somebody who's going to win people either on the Republican, independents, or the Democrats to support you in November? 
Well, I think if you look at the history of Iowa, it's, it's generally been considered a purple state. It has been. Not a red state, not a blue state. You purple. don't think that's past tense then? No, I don't think it is. As a matter of fact, every year there's a poll taken of Iowa, of Iowa voters, Iowa citizens. Who's their most favorite, you know, popular governor? It's always Governor Bob Ray, who was a very moderate Republican governor. And who are, the one who always finishes second was Tom Vilsack, who is a Democrat. Uh, and that's despite the fact that one other governor was there for longer than any other serving governor in the country, and it was a Republican. But those two are the most popular. So I think Iowans want common sense government. They want a governor that's going to come in and represent their interest, not out of state interest. They want somebody who's going to invest in their future and cares about them and, and leads that way. Look at these tariffs. I mean, my gosh, we've got terrible tariffs going on now all over the Midwest, particularly in Iowa. It's already over $600 million of impact. And we haven't even gotten to the corn and soybeans and ethanol issues yet. Uh, and our governor, you know, for the last month really hasn't said anything about it and it isn't really trying to do anything. Uh, we need a governor who's going to stand up for Iowans and who's going to care about them and invest in their future. And I think that's what people want. How would you label this last legislative session, which did pass a number of conservative social uh, issues, and perhaps the Republicans will con continue to uh, uh, control the legislature, how would you as governor deal with that? Well, I guess the, the, the single best word I would label uh, the last two legislative sessions, uh, 17 and 18 now, for this governor and this legislature, really pretty extreme. They took away collective bargaining rights. Uh, they've, they've denied access to health care, whether it's me uh, mental health, whether it's privatization of Medicaid or Planned Parenthood. They've been reducing access to health care all across the board. Uh, at the same time, the underfunded education consistently now for six years and they've reduced community college funding three years in a row and regents tuitions three years in a row. We now have the, the country's most extreme anti-women's health care law in Iowa. We've never been known for extreme laws. Iowans are known for being more middle of the road, not for being extreme. I think, I think people are, gonna, are recognizing that let's, these people in the legislature and the governor's office have gone too far. Uh, they've mis misread the attitude of the people, and it's now it's time to bring it back to where people are more comfortable. What do you hope to accomplish in this campaign? What message do you want to get across to the voters? I think our message is pretty simple. We're going to put people first. You know, and as, as he was talking, I was thinking about all those doors that I've been knocking already this session as I was thinking that I was going to be working on a re-election campaign. And what I'm hearing at those doors is that people are just, they want people, somebody to step up and do something that's good for them. That's what they want. They want somebody to be their champion. And that's what I expect um, that we're going to do. And we're going to send that message to everyone that we're going to put people first. We're going to make good decisions. We're going to help people to help themselves so that they can be successful. And that's the message we want to send. You don't have blinders on. Obviously, this is going to be a tough campaign. How do you think you're going to succeed? Well, I think uh, if you look at uh, what the, 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 some people say today, it's a toss-up race. So I think it, anybody can win. And we're going to, you know, people didn't expect us to do as well as we did in the primary. Uh, and we won 96 out of 99 counties. You know, we work hard all across the state in every county of Iowa. We have wonderful volunteers. We have a very strong campaign team. And, and we're very serious and we work hard. And, and Rita comes from that same mold. We're going to work hard for, to win every voter and every supporter all across Iowa. Because that's what it's going to take. Businessman Fred Hubble, the Democratic candidate for governor of Iowa, and State Senator Rita Hart, the lieutenant governor candidate. Still ahead, building a better writer, what is open to you to get that book or story or poem or whatever out of your head and onto some paper? But first, a look at some of the events that may be worth your time right now in the cities. Here's Laura Adams, Out and About. This is Out and About for June 18th to 24th. Hi, I'm Laura Adams. Hop a train to the Harry Potter Wizarding Prep School at the Putnam Museum. Complete your wizard apprenticeship at Quidditch training and attending classes about potions, charms, and more. Settle in for Pinkalicious and Peterific story time at the Rock Island Library, 3031 Branch on June 19th. Or visit Bishop Hill's Midsummer Music Festival, including performances, Scandinavian music workshop, Swedish Maypole celebration, and an old-fashioned barn dance on June 23rd. Celebrate Monmouth's historic tradition of creating quality stoneware and pottery at Monmouth Pottery on the Square, June 23rd. Or grab your friends and join the fun at St. Albans Trivia Night in Davenport, June 23rd. Summer solstice marks the longest day of the year. 15 hours of sun equals 15 hours of fun at Illinois Forest Preserve in Hampton, June 21st. Or on June 22nd, DJ Menmuls returns to the Mercado on 5th. Grab your lawn chair and enjoy Bass Street Landing's free 
Saturday Thursday night concert series and the beautiful music of the Bridges of Madison County continues on the Circa 21 stage while Mark Twain's timeless classic turned into the musical Big River sweeps us along on an adventure at the Bruner Theater Center through June 30th. Love, Loss, and What I Wore will be presented for one weekend only at the Village Theater, while the Black Box Theater presents Baby the Musical. For more information, visit wqpt.org. Thank you, Laura. David G. Smith splits his time between the cities and Nashville, literally. Earlier this week, he was performing in the Quad City area. This weekend, he's in a Nashville recording studio. And this coming Wednesday, he's offering a free songwriter workshop. We'll have more on that in a moment. But first, here's David G. Smith, recorded at Moline's Black Box Theater, performing a song he released in time for Thanksgiving two years ago. It's called Me Familia. Another migrant stuck in Nogales Shantytown, Mexican side Captured crossing the border A journey many have tried I feed them here in this comedor And some of them I know by name I ask them why they keep risking their lives Well, the answer is always the same Me familial Me familial My sisters, my brothers, the babies and mothers at night crossing the desert drown in the Rio Grande violence and poverty chase them on their run for the promised land and everyone who comes through here has a story and picture to show Desperate lives framing hopeful eyes Telling me why they still go Me familial Me familial Sisters, my brothers, babies and mothers Me Apart, but the children will break your heart, and I feed them every day because all of them are me, me, you, me, me, you, sisters, my brothers, baby. David G. Smith with Me Familia. As I said earlier, David is offering a free one-day songwriter workshop. It's coming up this Wednesday, June 27th at the Bluegrass Library. It'll be held from 9 until noon in the library. It's free, but you are asked to call ahead of time to register.
Speaking of workshops, the Midwest Writing Center is offering its annual series of workshops next week at the David R. Collins Writers Conference held at St. Ambrose University. It starts Thursday, runs through Saturday, and joining us is the Midwest Writing Center Executive Director Ryan Collins. Ryan, always good to see you. Yeah, thanks for having me. 13th annual David R. Collins Writers Conference, June 28th through the 30th. That's correct. You tend to get, a, how do you get new people to a conference like this? How do you get new uh, uh, potential writers to come to something like this? Sure. Uh, it's always kind of a combination of uh, locals. We have a lot of people who come back every year, and then we see a lot of new faces every year. And I think part of it is mixing up the, the faculty uh, a little bit. Like, we, we have a good core group of people, and we, we bring people back every few years, but we always try to find new people. This year, we have three new faculty members out of the four. Um, and I think that helps attract people yeah. um, because the workshops that they develop um, are going to attract different kinds of writers with different kinds of interests. Uh, like this year, uh, the digital storytelling workshop, we've never offered anything like that. What is that about? I mean, that just seems interesting. Sure. So Lauren Haldeman is a, is a poet and artist. Uh, she lives in Iowa City. Um, and, and her writing is amazing, but she, she's made short films. She's done some animation work. Uh, she's got an artist book. Um, so her talents are extraordinarily diverse. She's also a, a web designer. She does a lot of the web stuff for the University of Iowa. Um, and, and so I think she, what she's trying to do is uh, sort of like uh, digital comics, that sort of thing, or like poetry comics. We think of comics as always being sort of narrative or we maybe have like a superhero connotation to them, but like, it's like any other kind of animation. You can tell any sort of story and I think you can adapt any sort of text. Um, so she's adapted some of her poems. Uh, a couple of them are going to, her short poems are going to show before the, uh, the keynote event at the Figgy on June 28th. Um, well, and let's be honest, I mean, the workshop is a, ch a chance to kind of learn, a chance to network, but also you really sure. want to inspire. Yeah, I, uh, most of the workshops involve uh, some reading, some writing, some feedback, mm. but definitely, hopefully, you know, there's a sense of community in all those workshops and a chance for writers to meet. Um, other like-minded people and, and build some relationships and we've seen that happen over the years. I think that's part of the reason we get people who come back is uh, they're looking for that and they're looking to meet new people. Uh, and we try to keep it a, a, an approachable atmosphere but the workshops can be a little demanding um, mm -hmm. even for people who are just starting out. Um, they're, I think they're open to anybody, any, any skill level. Um, but there usually is some reading, there's some homework to take home. I don't know if I want to call it homework, but right. some reading to take home, some writing. Uh, they're, but they're usually generative, and I think, yeah, um, if you look at the, the faculty that we have and you read some of their work, um, I think that's inspiration enough, but getting to work uh, in a room with these people is, uh, is, is, is intense. I always take the poetry workshop every year. Um, I always try to carve a little time out uh, because I miss being a student and I always get something out of it. Um, and it always helps my craft and my work. So. One of the topics, how to write a compelling novel opening. Let's be honest, is that still the toughest thing for a writer, is just that beginning, so that it's a unique voice and it sets the uh, pace for the rest of the story? I, th I think so. Uh, having uh -huh. never written a novel, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, I'm punching a little above my weight, I guess. Um, but I think in any writing, yeah, you, you need to start strong. You need to get people's attention. Uh, I tell my students the same thing at St. Ambrose. I think that's one of the things about writing. There are a lot of things that translate between different forms of writing, even like a cover letter something like that like you need to make yourself seem attractive right. and qualified and competent quickly um, and I think in a novel you've got to convince people um, that the characters the story the arc um, all of those things are compelling and, and worth following um, they need to grab your interest oh, yeah but do a lot of stories die on the opening line oh uh, I, I don't know not not necessarily yeah. for me but uh, I think maybe sometimes I, I read a little bit differently than other people just being a writer as well I'm, I'm, I'm kind of there as a student um, and anything that I read. I want that enjoyment, but I'm also looking at it at a craft level um, where I can get something else out of it besides yeah. just sort of the entertainment, enjoyment, the, the thought provocation, anything like that. But sometimes the opening of a story can be really much a cliche, uh, the, the way some people try to use a hook. It's, it's, to me, it's really difficult. I mean, yeah. I, I think uh, my most difficult thing is probably titling poems. I'm more of a poet, um, and I think, you know, the title, that's your, that's your start, and the, that's often really difficult. So getting into it is, is, a, is a trick. Uh, and I think being able to find different strategies to do that, mm -hmm. obviously there are, yeah, right. There's a lot of there's a lot of well-worn um, ways you can go about doing that. Um, but if you can kind of set yourself apart or maybe take a different approach, uh, something like that, I think it can really set uh, the story off uh, early on in the reading experience. Another workshop issue is intimacy issues. Writing the not so personal personal essay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, because some people don't want to, you know, tell that much of their life. It's uh, it's challenging. Uh, it's a big risk. I think it's a lot to, to write about yourself and put your life out there uh, because once it's out there you don't necessarily have control about how it's received.
received. Mm -hmm. uh, but Liz is really great. Uh, she contributed an essay to an anthology uh, called Not That Bad that debuted at number eight on the New York Times bestseller list. Um, she's got a couple books coming out. Very and uh, I think she's got, uh, um, if you look at some of her work online, um, she's got a really interesting approach to that. There's a lot of uh, complicated feelings about personal essays out there in the writing world, and I think mm -hmm. just kind of in the world in general. Um, and I think the way, um, her, her voice and the way she sort of like goes about structuring those things is, uh, is really compelling. And uh, I look forward to seeing uh, how she can encourage people to be personal, but maybe not so personal. Well, now this, this writer's conference, not only is a chance for you to get feedback, but also a chance for you to give, because you're going to have manuscript pitches. I mean, mm -hmm. you're going to get a chance to perhaps sell your best story yeah. and find where it goes among an audience of peers and professionals. Yeah, so we're, uh, we have two presses that are taking pitches. Uh, the Midwest Writing Center has a press called MWC Press. It's a small kind of regional press, and we're looking for a bunch of different we're looking for something to inspire us to do kind of a special project. And then there's another local publisher, Paradisiac Publishing, uh, which is owned and operated by Lauren Wood. Uh, she's gonna be taking some book pitches as well. Um, she's got, I think, uh, a little more of a specific focus for the kind of manuscript she's looking for. But uh, if you check out the information and you have something that you feel like might be a good fit for either of us, yeah, come on out and uh, we'd love to hear it. Uh, it's, it's one of the most fun things about working at the Writing Center is bringing other people's work uh, to the public in some way. So once again, the Collins Writers Conference starts June 28th, runs through the 30th, St. Ambrose University. Tickets are available. Go to your website, find out yep. more. Let's talk about the Midwest Writing Center. You're still located in the Rock Island Public Library. What do you yes. offer to people that, I, you know what, I, uh, writing just seems to be a lonely thing. You just kind of do it in your own room and sure. you don't get that chance to share. And this really gives uh, writers, poets, anybody a chance to get an audience. Yeah, I think uh, there is a, there's some truth to that. Uh, you spend oftentimes a lot of times working on your own, but I really don't know any writers who have had any kind of success, broadly defined, um, that haven't had some sort of group or you know, other writers they've been able to share, share their work with, even at a distance, even if it's uh, you know, um, via email or something like that. Um, fi finding some people who are like-minded and who care about the work and who can kind of support you. Uh, especially if you're trying to publish, there's often a lot of rejection in that. So yeah. if you can find people who are going through that and appreciate what that's like um, and, and can kind of help like lift each other up, uh, give honest feedback, um, share opportunities. You know, there's, there, there, there are a lot of opportunities out there. It's hard to keep track of all of them. So one thing we try to do is make those available. But we try to, with all of our programs, create some space where, uh, you know, beginning writers or people who maybe feel self-conscious, you know, I, don't, I haven't done this much or I've been writing in a journal right. my whole life, but I've never yeah. shared anything with anybody, where they can come out um, and, and, and meet other people who have been doing it a little longer. And, and usually, um, I think we have a really good, uh, there's a really good writing community around here in terms of like being open to new faces and new voices. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if those people are out there, we encourage them to come by. We have a lot of free programs, we do a lot of workshops, and everything we do is aimed at kind of building that larger community of writers. And as you said, people will feel better. You get it out of your it's, system. It's really you true, it. yeah. There, I mean, there is a body of evidence out there to suggest um, emotional, yeah. uh, uh, emotional and physical uh, benefits to uh, to writing and, and to getting some, even if it's just journaling for yourself, it doesn't have to be for an audience. Okay, Brian Collins from the Midwest Writing Center, thank you so much for hey, coming. We you. do appreciate it. WQPT is doing its part to support the military men and women in the cities who are serving our nation. We call it Embracing the Military. And the Rock Island family and MWR office is hosting another newcomer's orientation and tour. It's an opportunity to get new service men and women and their families better acquainted with the Quad City area. It's free. It includes a breakfast and lunch. And the next tour is Thursday, June 28th from 8 until 5. You can contact the U.S. Army MWR to make reservations. On the air, on the radio, on the web, and on your mobile device, Thanks for taking some time to join us as we talk about the issues on the cities. Public Affairs Programming on WQPT is brought to you by The Singh Group at Merrill Lynch. Serving the wealth management needs of clients in the region for over 25 years.